Friends and colleagues, it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural lecture, the first inaugural lecture of this session. My name is Graham Furness, and I'm the pro-director for research here at SAS. I'm going to uh, uh, introduce the introducer, and I'm going to say a few words about the person who is going to say the vote of thanks. But first of all, I think I should just reiterate the point that Paul always makes uh, when he introduces an inaugural lecture, which is that this is, yes, indeed a lecture, but it's also a moment for celebration, a celebration uh, of the uh, inaugural lecture for the professor uh, who is uh, being named and uh, supported by the school, a celebration of their field of interest and also, in many ways, a personal celebration of them and their work. And so I'm delighted to see many friends of uh, Anne Powell's here in the audience, not only from across the university here, but from across the world. So welcome to you all, welcome to SOAS, and thank you indeed for being here. It is my, again, great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Itesh Sachdev, who will introduce Anne Powell's to you. Itesh was born and brought up in Kenya. He completed secondary and undergraduate education in the UK, doing psychology at the University of Bristol, and doctoral training in social psychology in Canada at McMaster University, Ontario. He then taught in applied linguistics at Birkbeck, the University of London, was head of department and head of the Birkbeck School of Languages, Linguistics and Culture. He is now, I'm delighted to say, Professor of Language and Communication here at SOAS, where he has also been Director of the SOAS UCL Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, Languages of the Wider World, was the title. He has served as President of the British Association for Canadian Studies and he is the current president of the International Association for Language and Social Psychology. He has published widely in the social psychology of language and intergroup relations, having conducted research with various ethno-linguistic groups, including those in Bolivia, Canada, France, Hong Kong, India, Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, Tunisia, and the UK. He is also the recipient of various national and international awards for his research, including the Prix du Québec, the Seagram's International Fellowship, and the International Language and Social Psychology Robert Gardner Award for his research in interethnic relations and language. <coughs> I should also introduce to you Another guest this evening, the person who will, at the end of this evening's lecture, offer the formal vote of thanks. And he is Professor Tony Lidicott, Professor in Applied Linguistics at the School of Communication, International Studies and Languages at the University of South Australia. Professor Tony Lidicott is also the President of the Australian Applied Linguistics Association and has been president of the Australian Federation of Modern Language Teachers. Professor Lidicott obtained his PhD from the University of Melbourne in French for a thesis later published by Mouton de Greuter as a grammar of the Northern French of the Channel Islands, the dialects of Jersey and Sark. His research interests include language issues in education, conversation analysis, and language policy and planning. In recent years, his research has particularly focused on ways of improving the teaching of culture as a part of language teaching. And his work has contributed to the development of intercultural language teaching methodology, an issue which, of course, is very much at the heart of language work and language teaching at SAS. And he has published many books and many papers in this area. And you will hear from Tony at the conclusion of Anne Powell's lecture. 
Just before I conclude and go and sit down and invite Itesh to come up to the podium, and I have to just uh, ask you please, as a matter of housekeeping, to make sure that you have either turned off or muted your mobile telephones. And I also need to point out to you that should the fire alarm sound, there are two exits on each side of the lecture theater, if you can't see them. So, having completed my housekeeping matters, can I invite Itesh to the stage? Thank you, Graham. Uh, sounded like an air, air, airplane announcement that I heard on the plane yesterday. Uh, and I think maybe I should continue, you know. Apparently, I'm wearing ca Canadian colors, bright. Uh, and I did take Air Canada yesterday. And I think when I began my journey yesterday from Toronto to London, the uh, purser came on and said, we thank you for choosing Air Canada. We know that you had a choice to be elsewhere but it's good that you're here with us. So I say the same to you, welcome. <laughs> okay, my job today is to introduce Anne Powell's to you. So I'm just gonna try and get this going, set up slideshow from current slide, that's it. Okay, now Anne and I have only recently become colleagues at SOAS, although when you look at some of our work, and at least I can think of uh, a long time back. I remember a long time back, and we were talking about this recently, we discovered that we were looking at each other's research at the same time, many years ago, even though we had never met, and we only met uh, officially three years ago, four years ago at SOAS. Um, I would say that Anne became familiar with my work in language attitudes at about the same time that I was doing some experimental work on how to persuade people to use non-sexist language. And was doing some really wonderful pioneering work at the time, and I thought that some of my work would benefit a lot, and it did. Thank you, Anne. Since then, I have followed some of her other work, uh, and I can say I'm really happy that our work has finally converged, and we're now collaborating uh, in the field of community languages, both in the UK, Europe, and, and elsewhere. Now, although our training has been quite different, Anne's is in sociolinguistics in Australia, mine is in social psychology from Canada, we do share a very important topic of our research, and that's the role of language and communication in multilingual settings. So what I want to do today is just very briefly tell you how I know her, well, I've already told you how I know her, so I met her here, give you a little bit of a background, her background in Belgium, tell you a little bit about her schooling, and I'm, I'm doing this because I want you to see that it's pretty amazing to see how languages are part of the air that she breathes. Uh, university and language, in fact, really, we should be talking about multilingualism, we, and she will be telling us a lot about that. I'll tell you about, a little bit about her doctoral work in uh, Australia, and then a few words about her academic career and a few words about her research. Okay, let's start with her background. She was born in Belgium, a uh, German-speaking mother, Dutch-speaking father. You can already start seeing the, the bilingualism, multilingualism coming through. Of course, Belgium is not a, an easy place uh, if you're living there, uh, particularly when it comes to issues with language. I think it's the only country in Europe at the moment without a government, of course, the language. And it is doing quite well, by the way. I hope there are no politicians in the room. Uh, or maybe there should be. Okay, um, her schooling, uh, her professional work has always had a very personal edge to it. She grew up in post-war Belgium. Um, uh, she soon became aware of the, the sort of the national politicized language conflict in, uh, in uh, Belgium at the time. In the 60s, there were some incredible uh, major upheavals in Belgium. There were riots, language riots, uh, triggered by the linguistically two nations, or the rivalries be between the French-speaking and the Dutch-speaking, Flemish-speaking Belgians. Furthermore, in those times in the 60s, uh, feelings towards German uh, speakers in the 60s were also pretty mixed, uh, uh, basically because, of, because the Belgians identified German as the language of the oppressor during the First and Second World Wars. And soon realized that language was much more than a mere tool of communication. In fact, in her youth, it was really a loaded 
a weapon, if you like, in her environment. And this early realization of the social and political com complexities of language use inspired her to dedicate, to examine the complexities of language use, uh, and she decided to spend significant amounts of her time uh, to studying languages both in school as, as well as university. And in school, you can see the, the languages that she learned, uh, Latin, ancient Greek, French, German, English. At university, she read uh, German philology, and which basically involved uh, an in-depth literary and linguistic study of German, Dutch, and English, and even some Frisian and Afrikaans uh, thrown in for good measure. Now, inspired by the language contacts uh, and particularly the lecturers that visited uh, her in, in her institution then, uh, there was a visiting uh, German-American scholar who uh, persuaded Anne to explore this area of linguistics further and particularly to go overseas. Um, and being a person who wanted to minimize risk, she's an averse uh, risk taker, she applied for a range of scholarships all over the place. And uh, given her record, one of the college scholarships she got was uh, from a leading Ivy League uh, university. But it was a chance encounter uh, with a very special person, the late Michael Klein, uh, who uh, from Monash University in Australia, that sealed her fate. In 1979, uh, she took up uh, the scholarship, uh, scholarship to study Dutch-English language contact in Melbourne, in Australia, completed her MRes in uh, 1980, and then enrolled for a PhD in 81, which she completed in two years. Uh, her PhD uh, was in the impact of dialect, uh, on, the impact of dialect on language maintenance patterns in the Dutch and German communities. She then began her career in academics in Australia. Uh, to begin with, uh, between 83 and 89, she was a lecturer in German linguistics at Monash um, University. Um, and then, um, what I should say is that in 1989, she became the director of the Center for Cross-Cultural Communication and, and Community Languages. Uh, the center was the outcome of a successful grant application to the, Department of, the Australian Department of Education and it focused on research and training to assist those working in the health and legal professions to deal with their multilingual clientele. During this time, she produced a book on cross-cultural issues uh, to assist those who are working uh, in medical encounters, to assist those who are working in medical encounters. And to this book, to this day, continues to be used in the Australian medical training uh, courses. In 1992, uh, and had a central involvement in the establishment of the National Languages and Literacy Institute of Australia, which was basically set up to support research on language matters as well as to implement the Australian national language policy. She became director of the, the associate or the affiliated center on language and society. During this time, she not only taught and researched in the field of multilingualism, but she started working with schools, preschools, parents, and community groups on issues of bilingualism, bilingual immersion, and the teaching of those community languages. Anne has always been keen to ensure that the results of research reach the communities and others who could benefit from this knowledge. Meanwhile, her research on language and gender, which, I, which is the way I met her, more specifically, the linguistic portrayal of men and women uh, was attracting the attention of the Australian government, which commissioned her to sensitize the Australian civil service to gender-biased language by producing guidelines for gender-inclusive and racially fair language. This exercise revealed the more controversial aspects of linguistic advocacy. Whereas her advocacy work on community languages and bilingualism was received warmly by the communities, very positively by parents, uh, community workers, thanked her for their, her insights, her gender work tended to attract less positive reactions. In fact, uh, Anne uh, received anonymous death threats and abusive letters accusing her of having butchered and emasculated the English language uh, for advocating the use of non-sexist language. In 1995, she moved to the University of uh, New England, 
uh, as the Foundation Chair in Linguistics, where she continued her work on multilingualism, gender, and language learning. Soon after them, she became head of linguistics department, and then head of school, and then she was headhunted, I think that sounded good, to take up the deanship of arts and become the first professor of languages, of ling uh, first professor of languages, uh, of, linguist uh, of linguistics at the University of Wollongong. That was in 1998. After then, uh, in 2001, she, were, she moved to the University of Western uh, Australia, where she was Dean of Arts, uh, Human uh, Humanities and Social Sciences, and also for her academic uh, affiliation, she was Professor of uh, Linguistics. Um, after this, uh, she was recruited to set up a new school, the College of Arts and Law, uh, at the University of Birmingham, and then we enticed her here, uh, where she became uh, last year the Dean of our Faculty of Languages and Cultures and the Professor of Sociolinguistics. I should just say a few more words about her research. Uh, I will not give you a full list, as it's very long, very extensive, quite innovative, and with a variety of very important uh, international collaborations. Um, her research area is language and communication with very, very specific attention to language, gender, and culture, language and migration, language and society, multilingualism and language learning, and of course, uh, language policy. During the past 25 years, she has initiated, facilitated, and participated in numerous research collaborations and developed a variety of research partners across many national and international context, and you can see a wide number of them spanning the whole globe. Um, in terms of her publication record, uh, there are a lot of publications, many books, a uh, large number of referee journal articles. She's got an enormous number of competitive research grants, being much needed money, research consultancies, and all kinds of commission research projects, and this could be your opportunity to go on the SOAS website and look them up. Uh, okay, her current projects, uh, which I don't know uh, how, how much she's going to talk about, but we'll see in a minute, are that these two, looking at the Australian diaspora, an interesting diaspora for those of you who live in parts of London where it exists, uh, and also uh, in the higher education context, she's looking at languages in the universities of the English-speaking uh, world. To give you a little flavor before I... Uh, hand you over to her, just to give you an idea of the titles of her book so you get an idea. Here's one, Boys in Foreign Language Learning, uh, Maintaining Minority Languages in Transnational Context, Australia and Europe, uh, Language and Communication, Diversity and Change. This is just a selection of them. Women Changing Language, uh, Cross-Cultural Communication, in Health, And the one, uh, the one that I think that's lost on this slide is non-discriminatory language. Now these titles give you a good idea of the kind of work that Anne has been doing over the last many years. Now before I invite uh, Professor Anne Powells uh, to speak to you, let me say that her arrival at SOAS has delighted many of us. I have already talked about her research, her academic and managerial contributions in higher education. These have been very outstanding. I should also add that uh, Anne couples her academic uh, success and responsibilities with, the, with some of the most wonderful personal qualities of generosity, humility, and pragmatism. As a member of her faculty, I'm very appreciative of this, and I think so many of my colleagues. Thank you, Anne. And with those words, let me uh, now invite Professor Anne Powells, Professor of Social Linguistics at SOAS, to come to the podium to give her inaugural lecture. I'll do quite a few thank yous afterwards, but I'll start uh, with a few small comments. It is with great delight, yet with some trepidation, that I stand before you to deliver my inaugural lecture. <laughs> 
Of course, one normally expects some nervousness before delivering a public speech. It actually gets the necessary adrenaline flowing, and I'm certainly not immune to that. However, my trepidation is more linked to the fact that I've had several attempts unsuccessful at inaugural lectures before, and therefore, I hope that there is no last-minute cancellation notice, a fire drill, or indeed a real other emergency. Let me briefly explain. As Itesh pointed out in his introduction, I became Professor of Linguistics in 1995 when I was appointed to the Foundation Chair in Linguistics at the University of New England in Australia. A few months after taking up the chair, I was contacted by the event management team to plan for my inaugural. To my surprise, actually consternation, I was told that the university had a bit of catching up to do, as the inaugural lectures had been suspended for a while. When I asked when I could expect to deliver mine, I was told that there was just a few others before me in the queue, and if everything went well, I could expect to be the first one to herald in the new millennium. It was 1995. <laughs> By that time, I had moved to the University of Western Australia as both Professor of Linguistics and Dean of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. Unfortunately, the university had ju just decided to abolish the practice of inaugurals, so no luck there. To make matters worse, the year I left the university to take up the position at the University of Birmingham, the university decided to reintroduce the practice. So you do understand that I was therefore delighted to hear that SOAS did have the practice of inaugural lectures, but at the same time anxious that SOAS would not change this practice before I had my go. <laughs> Meanwhile, I have learned that notions of time are somewhat different at SOAS, so there was little doubt of a change, of a massive change before I would um, <laughs> give my inaugural lectures. Also, before I commence my lecture, I would like to thank very much Itesh as well as Graham of Professor Sajdev and Professor Furness for their very kind words introducing me. I'm also very grateful to Professor Tony Lidicote, who is a long-term friend and colleague who is on sabbatical in Australia from the University, uh, sorry, in Europe from the University of Australia. Tony and I have shared a dedication to languages, language learning, and multilingualism for many, many years, and we've had the pleasure of working together to shape, or at least to assist to shape, the Australian policies around languages and language learning, from preschool right through to university. We have jointly relished the successes and supported each other, and that was more often, when we were disappointed at policy directions that seemed to turn the clock back decades and decades. Tony, thank you very much for your friendship and for your collegiality and for your willingness to undertake the vote of thanks. My most sincere thanks, however, go to my family and especially my partner, who has been there for me, not only in the stereotypical background way, but also in the front row and on the stage, sharing with me ideas, collaborating on projects, and keeping me to deadlines. Thank you very much. So let me go to my lecture. I've chosen to talk about a topic with which I have engaged for the past 30 years in both a professional as well as a personal capacity. I've also chosen a topic which I believe is quite accessible for people not specialised in linguistics, or sociolinguistics for that matter. Since my early years, I've been fascinated by languages, in particular the relationship between a system of symbols and the speakers and communities that use, abuse and manipulate it as part of human behaviour. As Itish mentioned in his introduction, my growing up in Belgium at the height of what was called the language wars and being at the same time a speaker of a then tainted language, German, has undoubtedly contributed towards my focus on language and linguistic matters, especially in sociocultural contexts. At university, I decided to go beyond the learning of languages and in specialised in sociolinguistics with specific attention to sociocultural aspects of language and communication, especially in multilingual settings. My work focuses on the interaction between language and society, exploring how language and communicative behaviour shapes and is shaped by our environment, physical as well as human. Given that my research is often centred around linguistic minorities and questions of language and power, I've always felt a responsibility 
to sharing the results of my research beyond the boundaries of academia. I therefore unashamedly engage in linguistic advocacy work and call myself a linguistic activist. My talk today brings together insights of my research, my professional and personal experiences over the past 30 years in relation to the management of multilingualism and the learning of languages. I've structured my talk around the following um, headlines. So I'll say, first of all, a few things about language and globalization, also about how to manage multilingualism, and then moving to combining both my, um, let's say, administrative work as a dean with that of a researcher on languages, looking at learning languages in this hyperlingual reality with specific focus on the higher education context. Speaking in front of an audience here at SOAS, it is almost superfluous to state or observe that multilingual societies are the norm rather than the exception around the world. Of course, the multilingual nature of a society, nation or country may not be officially recognised, but it is hard to find societies that are truly monolingual in their makeup. Yet, despite its exceptional status, monolingualism has certainly gained pole position, at least since the Romantic era, as a preferred linguistic condition to achieve linguistic harmony, unification, and indeed endorse state and nationhood. In my view, the strength of this romantic notion is still considerable today in many modern nations and continues to influence both the management of multilingualism and the provision as well as the conceptualization of language learning, as I will try to demonstrate in this lecture. However, let us return to multilingualism and linguistic diversity. Neither are static phenomena, and over time there have been considerable transformations, mutations, and alterations to the multilingual makeup of societies around the world. The growing number of languages that end up on the endangered list is one of the more dramatic permutations that warrants serious investigations. As colleagues will know, SOAS is at the forefront of this, in, of this research, being the home of the Hans Rausing and Endangered Languages Programme. Another prominent transformation is linked to the ever-increasing mobility and movement, real as well as virtual, across societies, communities and countries in the world. Whether voluntary or forced, legal or illegal, long-term or short-term, people are moving much more and more regularly across much greater distances than their ancestors even a mere one or two generations ago. So consequently, more people have first-hand experience of multilingualism and indeed of pluralism, uh, plurilingualism. I should say that uh, having done most of my work in Australia, we use these two terms as synonyms, but in the European context, the latter term, plurilingualism, is, refers to someone who can use several languages, whereas the former, multilingualism, is used to describe societies in which a variety of languages are used. This is particularly the case in large urban environments around the world where the presence of speakers of hundreds of languages is not unusual. In fact, a recent article in The Economist claimed that New York City had nearly as many languages, that is 800, as Papua New Guinea, the country often regarded as home to the most languages, around about 830. London is uh, reputedly home to around 230 languages. Despite a range of measures often linked to national security to curb wide-scale transnational movement, there is no indication that this hypermobility is likely to hold soon. Hence, hyperdiversity of languages, or to potentially coin a new term, hyperlingualism, is going to be characteristic of many environments and areas around the world for a long period. Although we cannot equate multilingual societies with multilingual individuals, as there is no one-to-one -one relationship between the multilingual character of a society and the linguistic abilities of its members, especially in the case of so-called territorial bio-multilingual societies, my birth country being a prime example of that one, multi -society, multilingual societies do accommodate a high number of bi- and plurilinguals. In some multilingual societies like India or Congo, going about one's daily business requires a repertoire of various languages and varieties, many of which are acquired rather than learned. On the overhead, I have quoted an example from a standard introductory textbook in sociolinguistics 
to illustrate the varied linguistic repertoire of an individual living in a multilingual society. Now, given the age of the textbook, you'll notice the outdated geographical uh, names. As it is fairly clear, I won't actually read it out, but give you some time to read it. Increasingly, we see similar multilingual interactions and repertoires in communities and countries whose multilingualism has become more pronounced or more visible in more recent times due to large-scale transnational movement linked to various forms of migration resettlement. For example, many countries in Europe, which had been source countries for migration to the New World, the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, have themselves become recipient countries, often from former colonies, of course, the UK, Netherlands, and France are typical examples, but also resulting from changes in visa regulations, for example, across the European Union, employment opportunities, and humanitarian causes. My next example is taken from a recent book by Jan Blomart on the sociolinguistics of globalization. Blomard, a fellow Belgian living in Antwerp, describes what I call the hyperlingualism of his neighborhood in which he lives. I'm quoting this as a poignant example of the new forms of multilingualism and pluralism found in cities and communities around uh, Europe. The repertoires of my new migrants often appear truncated. Highly specific bits of language and literacy varieties combine in a repertoire that reflects their fragmented and highly diverse life trajectories. Thus, recent West African, for example, Nigerian immigrants in Berchem may combine one or more African languages with a West African indigenized English, which will be used with some interlocutors in the in neighborhood and will also be the medium of communication during weekly worship sessions in a new evangelical church in the neighborhood. English, however, is not part of the repertoire of most other immigrants in the neighborhood. Most of the shops, for instance, are owned by Turkish or Moroccan people who often use vernacular forms of German or French as emergency lingua francas. So, when a Nigerian woman goes to buy bread in a Turkish-owned bakery, the code for conducting this transaction will, for both, be in a clearly non-native and very limited variety of local vernacular Dutch, mixed with some English or German words. At home, the Nigerian family will have access to television and the choice will go to English medium channels, with an occasional foray, often initiated by the children, into Dutch medium children's program. There will be a very low level of consumption of local printed media. At the same time, telephone contact in native languages will be maintained with people back home and fellow migrants now living in Brussels, London and Paris. Occasionally, there will be mutual visits during which the African regional language might be the medium of communication amongst the adults, while the children revert to vernacular forms of English to interact with each other. There, meaning the children's exposure to education environments in which different languages are the meaning of instruction, for example, Dutch or French, constrains their use of any other language. Those of you who live in or around London or any other major city in Europe may recognize this scenario as not that different from the now regular linguistic landscape, which let's call it Langscape, of many urban environments. These, well, as, as a linguist, you sort of have to try and make up a few words here and there. I'm not unique in that. These landscapes are no longer relegated to the distant and exotic lands or communities. My final example highlights another linguistic development, which can be linked to the heightened mobility or hypermobility, that of the multilingual family. This refers to a family whose members have been geographically dispersed for a period of time and as a consequence have acquired or learned various languages. In some cases, the dispersion has left them without a common language and therefore a need to communicate across languages, bilingually, multilingually, or find a lingua franca. In the interest of time, I won't provide a commentary to the slides, there are only two, as I think they speak for themselves. However, a little bit of information. This is actually a case study that was told by one of my former students to me just before I left uh, to come uh, and work in Britain. Um, I'm trying at the moment to use it to look at how 
such families, if they're interested in maintaining their language, what is it that they want to maintain and how best to do that? Because in most cases, language maintenance efforts have had a certain level of, let's say, stability, so that um, a group moves to a particular country, sets up structures to basically um, uh, maintain their language. In this case, as you will see, these people, fairly closely related, are moving fairly constantly. So what you see on this slide is basically, I will talk about Tuang and Dong. Obviously, they are pseudonyms. Um, also, my uh, sincere apologies for not pronouncing the um, Vietnamese names correctly. You will see that there are Swedish and French names. Again, this is at the request of the particular people who wanted to have their name reflected uh, in the language area in which they grew up. So we're basically looking at Tuang and Dung and that kind of family. So as you can see, they've moved um, quite a bit, but just as a background to it. The case study outlines the story of two Vietnamese brothers who fled Vietnam in the 1970s. Tuan was a chemistry lecturer visiting Australia at the time, and he obtained refugee status in Australia, but failed to bring over his wife and two young sons. His wife died of natural causes in Vietnam, and his two young children were therefore looked after by his brother. Truck and his wife, Mai, uh, wanted to uh, go to Australia, so they fled Vietnam, hoping to reunite with Tuan in Australia, but they ended up in France. For reasons unbeknown to me, Tuan's sons were unable to relocate to Australia and stayed in France with their uncle and aunt. The subsequent movements you can see on the overhead. And then in 2006, Tuan's two sons were reunited with their father in Australia and they now live in Australia. The next slide shows the linguistic resources of this multilingual family group. I'm not going to go into detail how much it is, but as you can see, they bring together quite a number of different languages. Of course, the scenario outlined on, on these two slides is not new. This type of multilingualism is quite typical of some well-established diasporic communities. However, I contend that the current conditions have led to a sharp increase in such families across the socioeconomic spectrum. So not only the top or the bottom, but the whole range. In fact, at a recent conference, as a recent conference in uh, Paris, I met an academic colleague from Denmark whose immediate family, meaning his partner and children, whose immediate family was spread over three linguistic zones. His partner commutes from Denmark to London on a twice-weekly basis. He works in Germany, and their children live with their Dutch grandparents in the northern part of the Netherlands during the week. All these languages have now become so much part of the family interaction that they are finding it hard to, difficult to decide which language is their native language. I'm sure that if I were to ask you if you knew such multilingual families, you'd be able to give me some examples, perhaps even that of your own family. I've provided these examples to give you a taste of the multilingual realities that are part and parcel of our societies, communities, and indeed for many of us, part of our daily lives. Indeed, our environment is increasingly multilingual, if not hyperlingual. And many of our fellow citizens speak and use a variety of languages in their interactions. Furthermore, the constellation of languages that make up this multilingual palette is a very dynamic one. New languages come on the scene with others shading in the background to re-emerge and others disappearing altogether. So let me move briefly to the area of managing multilingualism. Multilingual realities, especially those described before, have always been a challenge to countries or perhaps better states in terms of management. Questions that arise in the context of linguistic management of multilingual societies and multilingual situations include, should there be a, la a common language that is given official status as a national language? Should each language that is present in um, a particular area be given the same status? Is there a different rule for so-called indigenous languages based on use solis versus immigrant languages? Or should there be educational provision for all languages and if so, for whom and by whom. Linguistic management, the management of multilingual situations, belongs to the realm of language policy and planning, which by its very nature is a highly politicized field and subjected to ideologies and ideological debates around language and statehood, around human rights and indeed linguistic rights. <coughs> 
Although official actions and statements around the management of multilingualism are mainly in the hand of the political forces, broadly speaking, linguists, as well as scholars from other fields, just to name a few political scientists, economists, education, soci sociology, psychology, contribute their expertise to providing models and frameworks for the management of language problems and complex linguistic language situations, as well as to undertake critical analyses of language policy decisions, exposing often implicit ideologies in them. Of course, ethno-linguistic communities and groups within a state will also be able to uh, influence language policy, either through political representation or various forms of activism. The vastness and complexities of the management of multilingual realities prohibit me from engaging comprehensively with a mass of questions and issues linked to it. In my talk today, I will restrict myself to one specific aspect of this management, the learning of languages in this hyperlingual uh, environment. I've chosen to focus on the higher education context to examine this question for a variety of reasons. My own sphere of operation over the past 30 years has been the university in a number of countries, mainly Australia and now more recently the United Kingdom, but also Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium and Austria. My work linked to languages has often focused on higher education. Secondly, higher education institutions, and I don't mean simply universities, but institutes of advanced education, training colleges, etc., are usually the ones responsible for the training of language teachers. Thus, developments undertaken at this level will have, usually, an impact on languages elsewhere in the educational cycle. Thirdly, staff and students at higher education institutions, especially universities, are often part of the multilingual realities which I've just described. Academics and students continue to be a group that often traverses a, group, a range of linguistic zones throughout their careers and studies. This makes universities microcosms of this new reality. My attention is primarily directed at the impact of this new multilingual reality on the teaching and learning of languages in higher education. And, as you can see on the overhead, this translates into a number of questions, but I will uh, deal mainly with the two on the overhead is the linguistic diversity of a community reflected in the language offerings of higher education? And secondly, are language learning pedagogies, practices, and indeed models for teaching reflective of the linguistic profiles of the learners? In the next two slides, I present two tables, one in relation to Australian higher education, which draws upon my own work, and one relating to community languages in higher education in England, drawing upon the extensive report written by Itis Sajdev and his colleagues that presents data on the link between language diversity in the community at large and the provision of languages in higher education. I'm not going to spend much time on this overhead, but I just want to give you the various um, categories there so you can read them whilst I speak. On the one hand, you have the languages that uh, the 20 top languages spoken by Australian home students or domestic students. So these are not international students, but these are students that are Australian born or at least um, Australian citizens and who indicate that they speak a language other than English. As you can see, Cantonese has the most speakers. The ranking refers to the community languages ranking in the society in Australia. So the uh, largest group of um, community, or the, the largest group of community language speakers are the Italians. That's why it's got a one. Um, the third, uh, the, the next uh, area is the universities in which at least some form of provision is made. This does not mean degree programs per se, but it means actually that at some stage, some language, um, some course is given. And the final one of not such major interest to um, the current context um, is in fact which states of um, Australia offer some programs. This is uh, based on uh, slightly older data, so in the meantime, um, mostly more languages have disappeared rather than appeared. And the next one is um, the one for community languages in, 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 uh, in England. But just to say that in terms of Australia, as you can see, 
Um, there were quite a number of languages spoken by a substantial number of Australian home students. In fact, 18% of Australian home students use the community language other than English at home, and that covers about 120 languages. Yet, the provision um, at higher, uh, higher education is still relatively small. In terms of Britain, um, or in terms of England, I would say we, it reveals a fairly similar picture. What you have here is the top 12 community languages and it compares their provision with three foreign languages studied in the UK, French, German and Spanish. Of course, the latter are also used as community languages, but certainly are much more studied as foreign languages. As you can see, it is a fairly similar situation. The report particularly notes that there are no degree courses in the four most widely used community languages in England, Urdu, Cantonese, Punjabi, and Bengali. But then, uh, in earlier on, it did say, although SOAS will offer a degree course in Bengali from autumn 2008. Um, more recently, I've started gathering data from universities in continental Europe, the Netherlands, Germany, France, and Sweden on this matter. Given the amount of inter-European student and staff mobility, it is worthwhile to see how our other uh, European countries deal with this phenomenon. In the interest of time, I won't present the detailed figures for each country, but will give you a taste of my findings to date. My impression from the initial data is that the situation there is the same, if not worse, than in Australia or in the United Kingdom. An additional complication in many European countries is a lack of census type statistics on language use. In fact, in Belgium, it is prohibited to collect any information on linguistic backgrounds for fear that one group might win over another. And as Itesh pointed out, um, we still haven't got a government. Uh, it, the, the country runs probably better, but anyway. <laughs> So, um, Sweden. In Sweden, Albanian, Arabic, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, English, Farsi, Finnish, Kurdish, Polish, and Spanish are the main languages other than Swedish that make up the linguistic landscape. Although there are actually another 113 uh, languages recorded. English and Spanish are very well catered for in higher education, although not as community languages. In fact, only one language is, and that is Finnish. Some of the other languages which I've mentioned are available for study at mainly Uppsala or Stockholm universities, but all as foreign languages. The situation in German universities is very similar to that found in Sweden. Although German to some extent is more linguistically diverse than Sweden, as it accommodates a greater number of so-called guest workers, especially from Turkey, Italy, Greece, Northern Africa, and also more recently refugees from Eastern Europe and increasingly Asia, the provision of languages at universities is not linked to the multilingual reality. The largest language group besides German speakers in Germany is Turkish, and only 10 out of 104 compre comprehensive universities offer a Turkish studies program. However, the programs are not geared towards language acquisition, let alone students who have previous knowledge of the language. In countries with a so-called substantial colonial past, such as the Netherlands and France, there are a few institutions that cover the study of a very large range of former colonial languages. For example, in the Netherlands, Leiden, and um, I've just named one in uh, uh, France, in Alco, uh, in Paris. Although a substantive number of speakers of these languages have settled in the respective countries and actually are studying at the universities, these institutions have not changed their provision nor their mission in terms of uh, accommodating this focus. What we do see in a range of countries is an expansion of what Britain calls institutional-wide language programs, which are offered in language centres or institutes affiliated or incorporated in universities. Here we may find a greater reflection of multilingual realities in various countries, although often the increased offering involves new and newer world languages, such as Arabic, Chinese, Russian, and Japanese. So in summary, universities, despite being multilingual microcosms, have not accommodated their language offerings very much to reflect these new realities. Of course, the more political question would be, should the linguistic reality of a community be reflected in the language programs offered in higher education? This brings us back into the fascinating realm of language policy and to ideology-based ideology arguments whether or not to reply in the affirmative or negative. You will, maybe, will be disappointed, but I won't delve into this debate in this lecture, not because I do not wish to reveal my position or display my advocacy, but because I wish to touch upon one more aspect of this theme formulated 
in my second question. However, before I leave you, before I move on, I leave you with two observations why potentially it should be reflected. Schools in a number of countries, especially in Australia, now offer final year exams, so the equivalent of A-levels, in a large or a much larger number of languages, many of which cannot be studied at university level, thus forcing students wishing to study the language to go elsewhere. Here I particularly uh, talk about Australia, so if your language that you can study uh, at A-level is not available in Australia, you have usually quite a long trip before you can find somewhere. The other thing is I'll leave you to think a bit about that in terms of how on languages are or community languages suddenly appear when it comes to linguistic, uh, oh, sorry, security matters. Almost, so let's talk about the last question. Are language learning pedagogies and practices reflective of the linguistic profiles of the learners? Almost a year ago, I was asked to speak at a conference entitled Languages for the 21st Century, Training, Impact and Influence. The theme of the conference gave me the opportunity to reflect on the state of language learning in higher education beyond dealing with the crisis discourse that so often dominates discussions about language learning in Anglophone countries. And on the overhead, you have an example from 2007 where the title of um, the equivalent of the Russell Group uh, University's document was Languages in Crisis, and as you can see, the word is a rescue plan for Australia. So it gave me the opportunity to go beyond thinking about um, crisis and actually look to what extent university language teaching reflects or has accommodated to the hyperlingual and hypermobile reality we are living in. So let me talk briefly about the linguistic diversity amongst the student body. The profile of students undertaking any form of foreign or second language learning in university has become much more diverse than even a few decades ago. In part, this reflects the greater diversity among the student population per se, which is a consequence of the changing nature of higher education in many countries. Many universities engage in programs to widen access to higher education, leading to a more diverse student population in terms of socioeconomic background, class, race, ethnicity, language background, and other profile indicators. The internationalization agendas of universities encouraging students to study abroad, together with the continued necessity and or desire of students from countries with less developed higher education uh, systems to seek education abroad, has had a considerable impact on the linguistic and cultural diversity of university campuses. Thus, in the 21st century, the linguistic profile of many learners of languages is characterized by diversity in terms of linguistic background, linguistic competencies, language learning contexts, and experiences. In fact, the language student whose competence has been built primarily, if not solely, through language classes in school is becoming the exception rather than the norm. Whilst there is growing awareness and acknowledgement of this fact amongst language teaching professional, professionals, including at universities, the prevalent models and modes for university language teaching and modes for langu university language uh, learning have not yet come to grips with this fundamental change in learner profile. University language teaching, especially in the degree program, continues to operate with an underlying monolingual learner profile. That means the learner is assumed to be monolingual with either no prior knowledge of the language to be studied in the case of ab initio programs or whose prior knowledge has been gained through school-based formal learning. Learners who bring a plethora of plurilingual backgrounds or other learning uh, experiences to the university language classroom continue to present significant challenges to the university language learning structure. As a result, they often receive very mixed treatment in the classroom, ranging from being advised not to participate because of inappropriate language skills, either far too good or too vernacular, ignoring their bi- or plurilingualism and previous language learning experiences, considering them a nuisance or even a threat, to providing separate instruction for them and welcoming them as additional language input for other students. Most pernicious, in my view, is in, this, in this context, is the development of a discourse of unfair advantage. In other words, students have acquired knowledge of the language in question outside the lang uh, classroom are seen as having an unfair advantage to those having not had such exposure. <laughs> 
whilst measures to neutralise, and I use that word here in euphemistically uh, speaking, this unfair advantage, so whilst measures to neutralise this unfair advantage have become quite elaborate and very sophisticated compared to earlier times, and this is an example of earlier times, they nevertheless construct, continue to construct prior knowledge as something that needs to be penalised. I have taken out the particular reference to... Um, uh, the place. You can, of course, check Klein 2005 and then find it, but I thought I would read this to you. The board developed an official ways of discriminatory assessment in languages against students who or whose parents spoke the language at home. Their identities were detected by introducing ad hoc questions, some deviance on students' home background in oral examinations, and this information was used to mark them down in the written examination. In addition, the English in translations into English was overrated to reduce the scores of students whose first language was not English, and particularly orthographical and punctuation errors were penalized very seriously because they were considered typical of second-generation bilinguals. By the way, this went on till about the 1970s. In my observations of language classes in Australia and the United Kingdom, as I said, I've noted that a small but growing body of language teaching professionals are aware of this change in learner profiles and wish to accommodate to these changing learning profiles. Yet they are largely left to their own devices within a learning structure that continues to be based on the monolingual learner profile as described. Perhaps most unfortunate for a university context is that the impact on university language learning structures of significant advances in research on language learners, which, by the way, is usually generated in universities, is rather limited. Although students with a home background in minority community languages are perhaps most affected by this monolingual filter in current language learning provision, it is of course also affecting many other students who are bilingual who have had various other language learning experiences. In this context, however, it is interesting to note the following, and I stress, anecdotal evidence provided to me by both learners and teachers. The type of reaction does seem to be influenced by the language studied and the nature of the background knowledge. If the student's language is French and their background knowledge results from having lived in France or having a French parent, language departments tend to be willing to accommodate this advanced knowledge better or at least praise it rather than in the case of a student whose parents were from Réunion who spoke French and Creole at home. As this, purely, as this is purely anecdotal evidence, no conclusion should be drawn about the impact of language and speaker on this accommodation process. Yes, it does hint at linguistic and experiential hierarchies, not to speak of socioeconomic ones. In that context, I sincerely hope that the recent statement by the Education uh, Minister, Michael Gove, about the importance of languages is meant to be inclusive of all languages and all learners. And my very final thing, this is truly the last thing I will touch upon before handing over to Professor Lidicote for this uh, vote of thanks and a well-deserved liquid refreshment. I would like to end my lecture on a slightly provocative note, at least for some of you. It is provocative because some would say it would change the fundamental nature and purpose of language learning, acquiring native-like proficiency. In discussions with teachers and students of languages in Australia, New Zealand, and many parts of Europe, we've often talked about the issue of the desired outcomes of language learning in relation to the language skills component. I do take skills as opposed to studies. Although answers varied significantly in terms of depth, sophistication, and technical know-how, in fact, some uh, colleagues can refer to established language competency scales, frameworks, and benchmarks, whereas others simply say native, the overwhelming majority of answers made explicit or implicit reference to the native speaker. That is, reference was made to the desirable yet unattainable goal to acquire native-like proficiency in the language learned. Here I do not wish to comment on the rather difficult, if not impossible, task of defining what constitutes native-like proficiency, but rather on the issue of using the native speaker as the ideal and normative reference point for linguistic proficiency. Most respondents saw the goal of acquiring linguistic proficiency in another language to enable interactions with native speakers as the primary, if not sole, interlocutors for the learners. In other words, acquiring com competency in another language is about learning to interact and communicate in whatever mode or way with native speakers of that language. 
That construction of native speakers echoed that described by Claire Cramsh, a major uh, scholar in applied linguistics working out of Berkeley. In quoting her, recent research on individual and societal multilingualism had profoundly put into question foreign language pedagogy inherited from 19th century nationalistic ideologies. The idea that languages are autonomous and self-contained symbolic systems, that native speakers speak standard national languages linked to easily identified national cultures, and that any deviation of this standard is defective and has to be redressed. I raise this matter here not because of disputing the importance of striving for advanced levels of competence, such as those a native speaker has, but because the fo this focus on the native speaker as a prime target for foreign language communication takes little account of the growing reality of inter in multilingual interactions, as I've outlined in the first part, in which interlocutors use their foreign or other language in a lingua franca way. Of course, the prime example of this growing practice, at least in the Western world, is English, which has far more second and foreign language speakers than so-called native ones. Hence, learners of English are more likely to use English in a context devoid of so-called native speakers than to communicate with the latter. This reality has led to a questioning of the concept of native speaker in English and to proposed changes in language pedagogy. I believe the time has come to examine this uh, development in the context of other languages. Of course, this will affect some languages more than others. For, examples, lang for example, languages such as Spanish, Chinese, Swahili, Arabic, Russian, to name but a few, be may be more likely to be used in a lingua franca way than languages like Dutch, Czech, or Igbo. There is plenty of evidence in today's world that the romantic notion of one language, one nation is less and less applicable to language and linguistic practice around the world. Yet mainstream language pedagogy, at least in many university settings, is still implicitly, if not explicitly, couched in this romantic framework. In true academic style, which is probably befitting an, an inaugural lecture, I have raised questions which led to more questions and my answers or responses have also been in form of questions. However, the questions that I've raised, as so many other questions which occupy our attention, scholarly or not, require collaborative attention to find solution and to effect changes. So I thank you wholeheartedly for listening and hope that the lecture will inspire you or reflect or act as you see fit, or indeed, to formulate your own response to the title of my talk, The Politics of Multilingualism and Language Learning, Who Benefits? Thank you. This is my first experience of a British inaugural lecture, and as a discourse analyst, I've discovered that one of the most frequent speech acts is the speech act of thanking. In fact, I've already been thanked for the thanks that I'm about to give. <laughs> We've just listened to a presentation that has spanned a broad range of topics. It's presented us with some key issues, I think, that face all language teaching in all parts of the world, not just in the English-speaking world, which was the main focus of Anne's presentation. This presentation was actually very typical of Anne's work. I've known Anne for a long time, since we first met in the early 1990s as we worked for the National Languages Institute of Australia. At that time, I was just beginning my academic career, and I was struck by Anne's passion for and commitment to multilingualism in what was and what remains a very monolingual environment. Anne has always been someone who's challenged what our colleague Michael Klein has called the monolingual mindset, the idea that monolingualism is somehow the norm by which our world is judged. And she's done this for us again tonight. And Anne has done this regardless of the role she's had in academia. She is quite rare among deans as managers of the sorts of areas that teach language in actually being supportive of language. 
And in fact, her work as a dean in Australia actually led to some expansion of the teaching of language. In fact, to her and to the work of her colleague, Joe Winter, we actually owe at my own university the introduction of the teaching of Arabic. If you'd met any other deans in Australia responsible for languages, you'd be overwhelmed at how unusual such support and such commitment actually is. You here at SOAS are actually very fortunate to have a dean who is fundamentally committed to the teaching and learning of languages. Anne's presentation was thought-provoking, and she engaged us in a number of quite deep issues, I think without many of us really realizing where she was leading us. One of the things she talked about was the impact of the romantic idea of one nation, one language, the unification of language and national identity. This is actually something that for me as an Australian returning for England for only the second time in my life uh, has been brought home to me a lot. I come from a country of immigrants, but we tend to think of immigration as something relatively recent. My immigrant story isn't recent. My entire family have been in the country for more than 150 years. When they left home, that ideal of uh, one nation, one language, was being strongly articulated through the Romantic movement, as Anne has discussed. If you think of the immigration experience of my family, to leave family and friends, to go to the other side of the world in a journey that took months, never to see your family again, never for many of my family to have any contact with them again, because a number of my ancestors were actually illiterate. There were no telephones or anything like that. And for one of my great-great-grandparents <clears throat> to have left a minority language community in the Netherlands, the Frisian community, to go to a country where he would never have again met a Frisian speaker, you can understand how the sorts of immigration experiences of those times meshed with the idea of one nation and one language and how people assimilated quite readily to those sorts of ideas going to a new country such as Australia. If we look at what Anne has just introduced us to in her anecdotes tonight, we can see that world, the world of my immigrant ancestors, is not the world of the contemporary migrant. A contemporary migrant can have regular contact with their home through visits, but through technologies and so on. Language is no longer the choice of which language. Language is, in, now, in these days, much more possible in forms of multilingualism and quite complex forms of multilingualism. And I want to thank Anne for sharing that insight with us tonight. For me, it was one of the most powerful things that came out of this presentation. She also spoke about another issue and underlined the importance of it, the idea of the unfair advantage. The unfair advantage is in Australia, and I know in other parts of the world, a very strong discourse. It's a strong discourse that actually limits the possibilities of language learning. It limits it by assuming that language education is for the mainstream. It's for the monolingual, monocultural, mainstream group to move out perhaps a little from their monolingualism and monoculturalism. The reality of the needs of language learning are actually such that that is not the only model we should have and not even the dominant model we should be considering, as Anne has reminded us. We don't think of the English native speaker sitting in a class of international students as being unfairly advantaged. Similarly, we should not think of someone who speaks a language at home or because of the various experiences of their lives as having an unfair advantage. We all have languages. We are all differently abled in different languages in different contexts. And our education systems need to adapt to recognize that as the reality of human life, as Anne has indicated to us. Finally, she introduced the idea that the monolingual native speaker 
is not the model for language learning. She, she reminded us that language learners are, to use Claire Crampsh's term, uh, an academic that Anne has already cited, intercultural speakers. That is, when one learns another language, one doesn't learn to become a native speaker, one learns to become something quite different, a person with multiple languages and multiple cultures. And Claire Crouch reminds us that this perspective, the intercultural speaker, is a privilege. It's not the negative of the non-native speaker. The intercultural speaker allows us to see things from multiple perspectives, from different perspectives, from inside and from outside. What we've just heard tonight, I think, is part of that privilege. Anne's lived experience of multilingualism, personal and professional, has allowed her to develop new perspectives on the situations that confront people in policy, in practice, every day. And I'd like you to join me in thanking her for bringing these issues to her attention with such fervour and with such commitment. Thank you, Anne. I have one more thank you to make, and that's a thank you to all of you who came along this evening. An inaugural lecture is a wonderful opportunity for an academic to present ideas that have been a passion of theirs to a new audience. Thank you for coming along. Thank you for so many of you coming along. And thank you for your time and commitment and support coming here. We'll end now. And I'll remind you that there is a reception upstairs to continue the celebration of Anne's work and that you're all welcome. Thank you.